first of all, thanks for doing this. It was no short problem. Um, and I want to thank you also for doing the other one back in Chicago, because uh, I don't know if you realize, but you had a big impact on me. I'm running this thing called Imsta, and you were the first person I heard speak about stuff like, um, you know, the role of, of these companies and how they should take more responsibility uh, as opposed to trying to shame kids. I, I really took it at heart and I took it back to our industry. So thank you for being so blunt and so honest. Um, so today, I, as I mentioned, I want you to, to do a little bit of that, but towards the end, uh, because I think it's a message that people need to hear uh, to refresh your memory if, if it needs to be refreshed. I remember you saying stuff to the people in the audience that if, uh, you know, if, if you open up a, a page and you, you can't get a hold of the company and I mean, they don't deserve to be telling you to buy the software you use. I, I really, you, you made an analogy with, with Uber, how people think it's a, you know, the, the people who run it are so horrible, but you still use it because the service is so good. And if the service and the software side was good, I'm just refreshing your memory, but I thought it was so well done. I wish I had recorded it. Anyway, thank you for that. The, the, the industry knows about that kind of a point of view from uh, not just so from you, but you know, we, we tell them, look, you serve people. So anyway, uh, I got Rich uh, Chicky here, who is an old friend of mine and, and does a lot of recording. I don't know if you know him, uh, Steve. I don't know. I don't think we've ever crossed paths, have we? No, we haven't. Yeah. But nice to see you, Steve. Your uh, uh, problem problem with music was required reading. <laughs> well, that uh, that was an essay that I wrote in the '90s that sort of outlined a number of the uh, the number of the problems with the power structure of the music industry as it was then. Yeah, yeah. It goes without saying that the music industry is quite different now because uh, it's not based on the scarcity model of selling physical products, but it's there's a sort of an artificially created scarcity model by having access to streams uh, of music on certain platforms. Uh, and so some of the same dynamic is in evidence, but the- you It's know, definitely changed. Yeah. And, and there are even some of the same people that are pulling the same, pulling or trying to pull similar levers. Uh -huh. uh, but sure. Sure. But still great, great reading. It's, it's really, it's, it was funny how a lot of the stereotypical little phrases, how, how many times that would show up in with one's career, you know, when you listen to the, the warms, the punchies. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, things become cliches because they, they, uh, they make it possible for someone to speak in an apparently knowing manner right. without having to actually know anything. It, right. it, it does a lot of the work of actual knowledge by just creating a familiar, uh, res you know, creating an unexpected or familiar response without uh -huh. the, the person who's speaking actually having to know anything. Right. <laughs> and, and it shows up in, you know, shows up in all kinds of things but when you're dealing with something as ephemeral as music or a sound quality where there are essentially no like uh benchmarks where there's essentially no calibration where you can say yeah this is 7 db out of alignment and at the 13 kilohertz region you know like you, you know you could say oh it's it's bright you know like you, you just <laughs> there are these things that you can say uh -huh. that that get you out of the the conversational bind sure without, sure yeah Exactly, exactly. Okay, so I think we'll we'll get started. Um, I think we've already kind of started, but but Steve, I just want to get a little bit of background on you before we get started, and I'll do a little preamble here to welcome you. Oh, so thank you. Pratik, uh, are we ready back there? I think so. All right. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, this is Ray Williams, and uh, welcome back to Insta Festa. It gives me great pleasure to introduce a very principled and opinionated man in the music industry that I admire greatly. He has spoken to us before at the InstaFest in Chicago, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome Steve Albini here, who really, for most of you, should need no introduction uh, to talk about his life, his career, his philosophies, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun uh, today. So welcome, Steve. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And I guess I'll just open it up with, with uh, you know, how, how did you get drawn to music? Why are you not an architect or something else? How, how did you, how'd you get into music? Well, I was a fairly typical dorky kid. Um, you know, I had all the same 
adolescent uh, occupations as as everybody else as a teenager. You know, I was uh, somewhat mischievous, and I had a, a sort of a, a clique of friends that I hung out with, and we all had our sort of in, internal language, and um, we would go off on our individual obsessions, and they would sort of become a group identity, like you know manner of dress, manner of speech, things that you're interested in, whatever. And then uh, at some point, um, and music was kind of casually an interest of mine. It wasn't an obsession by any means. Um, And then at some point I heard uh, the Ramones uh, and I remember the moment I heard the Ramones and I, the, my instinct, my instinctive response was to laugh at this band and their music because they're, it was such an absurdity. They were trying to play, or apparently trying to play this sort of bubblegum pop music, you know, patterned after um, pop music of the 60s, but they were playing it with this overwhelming ferocity, like this, just this blazing intensity. And the subject matter of the music was uh, all of these sophomoric and childish things that me and my friends were slightly embarrassed that we were into, you know, like trash culture and horror films and taking drugs and petty vandalism and things like that. Those were all the, the sort of hallmarks of, um, of a sort of an uppity adolescence. And here was this band who had sort of formed an aesthetic around these trashy, um, hidden parts of culture. And so I, I immediately it fascinated me. Initially, it was just hilarious. It seemed like a joke. Uh, and I it got a hold of my own copy of the record and I played it obsessively. And eventually, it beca- I just immersed myself in it and it just became an entire worldview. That is that you could be writing a mania uh, of your own invention that focused on whatever ridiculous things your mind was drawn to, no matter how trivial they seemed to be to the straight outside world, they were legitimate, you know, they were legitimate things for you to obsess on. Didn't have to be things like uh, classic form and traditional beauty and uh, the, you know, the the heights of moral purity or whatever. It it could be um, wanting to hang out and sniff glue with your friends. It could be, um, you know, getting into a fight with somebody for a stupid reason. Like uh, those things were legitimate areas of, of, of art and culture. So then I, th- I felt like I learned something about the Ramones by listening to their music. I felt, I felt like they were communicating with me through a medium that wasn't literal and that fascinated me. And the, the aesthetic and the world that was described by their music was something that I wanted to be a part of. And so I, I started searching broad, more broadly for things associated with underground culture and punk music. And, uh, you know, it, it opened my eyes and opened my mind to um, possibilities and to acceptance of things and people that were different from myself. Like I grew up in Montana. My, my adolescence was in Montana, which is a monoculture. It's all white people. It's all conservative people. And I don't mean conservative just in the political sense. I mean, conservative in that people have been hanging out with the same group of people their whole lives. They've never traveled widely. Uh, they've thought the same thing at, at 45 that they thought when they were 15. Um, you know, their routine or their their trajectory in life was fairly predictable from the moment they were conscious until, uh, you know, through adulthood. And that, that conservative nature, that sort of not wanting to learn, not wanting to know, not wanting to change, that imbued everything that you heard from any, come out of anybody's mouth. And the, the Ramones were the thing that broke that for me, that made it so that, uh, when I, I didn't have to think the same thing that all my peers thought. I did not, I didn't have to carry the same prejudices. I didn't have to use the same currency for value. You know, like I could appreciate someone, someone's purity of intent rather than their moral compass, or I could 
appreciate uh, somebody's savagery rather than just their elegance, you know, things like that. There was a, it's, it's difficult for me to articulate and I've been kind of struggling with it my whole adult life, like trying to, trying to comprehend how I can have a broken value system and a broken, have broken through a value system that was so carefully ordered into one that's quite chaotic and still feel comfortable, you know. So from Montana, I came to Chicago to go to college. I chose Chicago partly because I, I mean, I was interested in journalism sort of formally and I was accepted to Northwestern's Medill School of Journalism, had a good reputation and I thought that would, you know, be useful in the job market, whatever. But mainly it, the proximity to Chicago meant that I, I, I thought I was likely to find a cool music scene to insinuate myself into, and I did. And then once I came to Chicago to go to school, like the main project of my school years became getting involved in the music scene in Chicago. And um, the, the music was just engrossing and the scene was just fascinating to me. It was every kind of weirdo that I could ever have imagined and a lot that I could not have imagined. And they were all sort of banded together in this community that um, where the, the currency wasn't money or status, but the currency was how awesome the experience we all got to have was, you know. Um, and it, I, I felt like those notions that I'd picked up in a kind of a secondhand way from the Ramones, that all kinds of people mattered, that all kinds of people were cool, that you could be into anything and still find some kind of beauty or purity in it. All of those notions were um, reinforced by my interactions with the music scene here in Chicago and the peer group that I developed. And that peer group um, eventually, like I, I got into bands and I was able to play with some of my heroes, my, the people who, who had in, excited me about music when I first got to, to town here. Um, and I'm, when you're in a band, you, you want to make recordings of your band so that there's something to remember the experience of having been in a band in because be, being in a band is awesome, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, back in Montana, even, I was the nerdy guy who took it on himself to rent a tape machine and some microphones and make recordings of my own band. And then I did the same thing in Chicago. I recorded my own bands in Chicago. And then um, through that activity, I became a resource for my friends' bands and my acquaintances' bands. Like uh, if I, if they wanted to get something recorded, they could ask me to do it because they knew that I wouldn't screw it up. I was, you know, they had, they had some confidence that I had, had the ability to do that, right? And then over time that progressed into me doing actual studio sessions and making actual records for people. Uh, and through this whole thing, it never occurred to me that that would be my profession. It only ever seemed that, that 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 was fulfilling my role in the scene here or fulfilling my ambitions as a as an individual like I wanted to be part of a music scene and one way that I could insinuate myself into that music scene was by being the guy that did recordings for bands right uh, and eventually that grew into me building a studio in in my house what you know I Graduated school, got a job, got a mortgage, bought a house, um, built a studio in the basement of that house. And that studio um, was useful for me and my friends' bands as a resource. And then eventually I had enough work that I could quit my straight job and just be a recording engineer. And, and that happened in the late 80s, I want to say 88, sometime in 1988. 87, 88, I forget when, it, when all this happened. But at any rate, that was a, that arc from me discovering the Ramones through shaping my life around the utility it had toward getting me into a music scene, toward me being a professional engineer and that being my occupation. That whole arc took about eight or nine years, something like that, um, which is about the same as any professional, uh, like if I wanted to be a doctor, it would take about that same amount of time. If I wanted to be a lawyer, it would take about the same amount of time. Um, so at the end of that arc, I'm a professional recording engineer 
And that's where I've been ever since. Like music still has the same place in my life. I still use it as a, as a talisman, to, as, a, as a, a way to escape my normal o- obligations. And uh, the, I still intensely value the social relationships that I've developed through music. The, the feeling of community that I have inside the music scene is incredibly valuable to me. And it's probably the, the most important thing to me is the, the friendships and the relationships that have developed through me being involved in music. But n- now things are, are slightly exaggerated over they were when I was just playing in the basement with my friends. Like now I own this big building that has a couple of studios in it. And, um, you know, I have the obligations of a staff of employees and uh, I, my band has I have less and less time to work on music with my band, but I still retain the sort of satisfaction that I got out of playing in a band in the very beginning, you know. So it sounds like um, a lot of the uh, aesthetic, a lot, a lot of the original feeling you got from the Ramones translated into how you actually operate your studio, because your studio is a little bit unconventional. For someone yeah. of your stature, um, you still work with a lot of small bands. You, it seems like you consider yourself almost like in the service industry. That's a good way to put it. Although, I mean, it, um, the service, in, service industry, by and large, you have like working class people who work at the behest of large companies who are sort of, um, it, they're interfaced with the, the public, you know? Uh, so you have, wait staff and uh, desk staff at a hotel or retail salespeople or whatever. And they are serving uh, the public, but they're serving the public in a way that benefits a larger corporate entity, generally speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a very small scale entrepreneurial business where like, I'm the guy that owns the building. I'm the guy that owns the business. Uh, you know, I'm here every day. I answer the phone. I do the, the grunt work here. It's, it's not structured in the same way as other service industries, but um, I feel like I am providing a service to the music community in Chicago and in the world, really. And um, I, I do think that there's, an, uh, there's, a, there's a difference between the way underground musicians saw their role and mainstream musicians. Like mainstream musicians by and large had ambitions to be sort of in the mainstream popular culture. Like they wanted to be successful in broad terms um, and sell as many records as physically possible to as many people as physically possible. And, you know, enjoy the kind of celebrity that people at the peak of that, that industry get right in the underground. We just wanted to keep doing it. We just wanted it to remain viable so that, um, you know, every, every year that you get another, you know, another successful year means that your, your band survived another year or your club survived another year or your record label survived another year. Um, it, it doesn't mean that you're, you know, you win Grammys and gold records and things like that. It just means that your, your wing of the culture is still viable. Like people can still find that art and that community and thrive within it, you know, uh, that's the, the, the goal. It's not maximizing profit. It's not maximizing a- extraction from an audience. Like you see the, when mainstream capitalism interfaces with the, the entertainment industry or the music business, the music scene, you see these big players um, that move into a scene that's, that's vital and vibrant and um, they, they build these big entertainment palaces, which are meant to get as many of those asses in the seats as possible and get as many of the dollars that are swirling in that economy, get as many of those as possible, capture them and take them back to uh, the corporate ownership, whoever that is. Um, and in, at my level of business, uh, everything is about uh, stabilizing and maintaining and extending this scene and this this culture and this community as much as possible. So um, 
salaries are low. You know, people don't take a lot personally out of these businesses. Uh, reinvestment is extremely high. Like if you have a good year and you make a bunch of money, you don't pay yourselves bonuses. Uh, you take that money and you get new equipment or you expand the capabilities of your studio or you, you know, renovate your club or you get a new van for your band, something like that. Like the, the, the reinvestment is extremely high relative to other, other ways of, of looking at the business. Um, it, it's, you could say that it's unconventional the way I operate the studio, but it's not unconventional within the confines of the, the music scene. Like if you look at your, my, my peers, not my peers at scale in the, in music recording studios, but my peers at scale within the music scene, like people who run successful record labels, they behave the same way I do. People who run longstanding treasured local venues, those people behave the same way that I do. Um, people that have been in uh, sort of musical cooperatives of one kind or another, uh, whether it's uh, uh, a, a co collaborative cooperative record label or a group of people that give music lessons or uh, people that are, that work together in an outside environment, but socially um, hang out together with a, as a peer group of musicians, like all of those people behave the same way. It's not unusual for people to behave this way. It's unusual for businesses to behave this way because there is a kind of an expectation that businesses will try to extract as much profit as possible from uh, their client base without ever considering their client base, their peers or their comrades or their friends. Um, so if you run a traditional capitalist business that manufactures parts for something, you want to get paid as much as possible for those parts. And you want your parts to be used as widely as possible th through the industry. So the industry becomes dependent on you, but you certainly don't consider the other people that you do business with uh, your comrades or your your friends and certainly a competitive business or a business that does the same thing. You wouldn't wish that business well, you wouldn't want that business to also succeed because they'd be taking some of your market share and some of your client base. You would be in literal competition with them. Whereas in the music scene, you don't feel that whatsoever. Like bands don't feel like they're in competition with each other. Um, I mean, sometimes there's friendly rivalries, but they're certainly not direct competition. Um, at, at, some, at one point, there were as many as 20 or 30 recording studios in Chicago who were all serving the same music scene that we served. And that was the best time to be involved in the recording scene in Chicago because they were all mutually supportive. Like if you needed a piece of equipment, you could borrow it from your, one of your uh, fraternally associated studios. Um, if a band had to leave one studio because of some problem and come to your studio, you'd be more than inclined to accommodate them rather than hang them out to dry because they weren't your client already, that sort of thing. Uh, so the, the structuring the business as a kind of a, a, a loose social entity that has obligations and um, responsibilities within the social structure of the scene, that may be unusual if you were to go to, you know, take a list of the top, million companies or whatever and see how many of them behave that way. You wouldn't find very many that behave that way. But on a small scale in a local economy and in a, with a, like a, uh, inside an insular or a peer group uh, of clients and other affiliated businesses, you'll find that a lot of people behave that way. Well, I think uh, we could, we could speak for, for all the IMSTA members that are watching in Chicago to say thank you for for really providing this 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 vehicle and this avenue for small bands, um, but you must get this question a lot. And I just I'm just curious, you know, when when you when you've worked with Nirvana and all these huge huge acts, and you still take um, a small band, um, what, what explain why you would still record a, a small act that comes in? I think well, I'm curious as to why Steve Albini would do that. Well, there, I mean there is a top tier or like a, a, a well-funded tier of the music business, which is, you know, these superstar acts. 
And, and I have on a couple of extremely rare occasions worked with bands like that, but like I've been doing this since 1980 something. Right. Uh, and the, I can count on one hand, the number of like really big superstar type acts, headline type acts that I have worked with. And over a span like that, like if, if I worked in a restaurant, I probably would have run into that many celebrities, you know, it's, I, it's just not a core part of our business to work with people at the top of the, of the scale, the, the bread and butter business, the day to day of our studio is that we're a working studio for working musicians to make recordings of themselves to use in rather mundane ways. Either they're going to put out a record themselves or someone else is going to put out a record or they need to make a recording so that, it can be used uh, for licensing purposes or to be part of a film. Like largely it's to make records, but mostly it's at the behest of bands who want to make a recording of their music for posterity. And, and that's our, our bread and butter. That's our day-to-day -day client base. Um, every once in a while I cross paths with somebody who's famous and, uh, and wealthy and I work on a record that's a much larger scale than that. But it's a vanishingly small percentage of our business. So let's, I mean, it's very, uh, I, I, honestly, it's very similar to like, if you run a sandwich shop that's famous for, you know, good sandwiches at a good price or whatever. And then on the wall, there'll be a bunch of pictures, you know, there, Oh, the Danny DeVito eating one of our sandwiches. You know, It's like very, very similar to something like that. Like, yes, we do work with people at the top end of the music business, but much more, much less often, then we work with people who are, like I said, our, our peers, people who are still active in the music community and, you know, just bonding with their, their fellow cohort, you know. Of course, we have to now mention one of these big, uh, very successful artists, Nirvana. Everybody's going to want to hear about that. I think Rich has more questions on this. Uh, but just tell us a little bit about how that happened and, and, and how you end up working with, uh, with that band. Well, Nirvana were a, a working band in the same manner that I described, where they they came up through the ranks in the underground, um, and they became popular by when at, they became distinctly popular at a point when their record label, the independent record label that they worked with, um, made a deal with a big record label to release future releases on a bigger platform. So then they had a uh, bigger budget to record with. Uh, they had the backing of MTV at that point. MTV was the, probably the biggest cultural influence on the music scene at the time. Um, and they struck a chord there. You know, they were, they were, became a very popular band, became the most, the biggest band in the world. But that happened uh, after they had spent half a dozen years trudging through this grubby punk rock underground where they were sleeping on people's floors and they were playing at a squat, uh, you know, and they were, you know, driving overnight to get to a gig in Utah to find out that the gig wasn't advertised. And so they had had to play for four people like, and like they had had all of these formative experiences that were part of the character building uh, in my music scene. And we knew a lot of the same people. We were very much from the same, background very much from you know we we had all of these common experiences and all these shared friendships and we 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 knew all the same things we had all the same run-ins with the the straight community and uh so it, it was perfectly comfortable for them to approach me like for me to to work on a band like that was exactly the same as for me to work on a smaller band who had all of the same experiences except the one where they got super famous you know so it was quite comfortable. Um, we communicated well. I was conscious of their celebrity, for lack of a better word. And I wanted to be respectful of their privacy and their, you know, their peace of mind. So I tried to make it clear that in an environment where there were a lot of people who were trying to attach themselves to them, like a lot of people were trying to become part of their crew so that as Nirvana got 
more famous and more influential and more wealthy, they would siphon off some of that fame and that, some, that influence and that wealth for themselves. I wanted to make it clear that I wasn't one of those people. So I, I never tried to get, you know, I never tried to become bosom buddies with them. I never tried to get involved in their, any other aspect of their business. I made it clear that I was an employee, that I worked for them. And, you know, our professional relationship was really good. We developed over time, I developed a warm personal relationship with Dave Grohl and with Chris Novoselic. And, uh, uh, but I never pressed Kurt for any real intimacy. Um, and they approached me, I'm fairly certain, because they had heard other records that I had done that they liked the sound of. At least that's what they expressed to me. It's often painted in the popular press as that there was a, an ulterior motive to using me, and that ulterior motive was to um, to thumb their nose at the professional class of producers and other record people that were in the, the rest of the mainstream music business. And I don't think that was... I don't think that was on their mind at all. Like, I don't think they, I don't think they cared the slightest bit about what other people thought about their choice of working with me in the studio. I think that it was just a, a purely practical and reasonable decision for them. Here's a guy that's made records we like. He knows all the same bands that we like. He's friends with all of our friends. We can make a record quickly and efficiently with him. And if we do that, then we get to keep more of the money. Let's do that. You know, I think that it, it, the decision doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. Great. So, Steve, uh, if you don't mind me asking, um, I wanted to ask you about the role, especially, say, in, in Nirvana's case, say, as, um, as producer, there's producers out there that... Uh, they don't really play instruments. They're, they're more considered, they consider themselves to be spiritual advisors where they, you know, they manipulate, uh, manipulate the band uh, to, uh, to give their best performance uh, through that spiritual advising. So in, in Nirvana's case, so you have a lot of technical knowledge. So what kind of, uh, what kind of line were you walking there? What was the, uh, what was the impetus as far as producer versus being engineer? Were you changing hats, so to speak? Or? Well, my, uh, my normal approach in the studio is, is not to act as a producer. I mean, there, there's a, that's a kind of a loaded term because it has had different graduated meanings over time. In the very beginning of the music industry, the producer was an employee of the record label and he was assigned with making a record. And so he would, go to the A&R staff, that is the artist and repertoire staff, and the artist and repertoire staff and the producer would assemble a group of musicians or a group of, of people to, to come together to make this album. They would select the artist, the artist and repertoire person would collect songs written by a professional songwriting community. Um, they would use session music musicians that were organized by the producer. Um, you know, it was a very corporate thing where you had these people at the, at the top sort of directing the behavior, every, every, everything that happened in the studio. And then um, later on, as self-contained bands became the, the norm rather than a titular artist with an assembled backing band, uh, in the music scene, the, the self-contained bands became the sort of standard. Um, and then the producers were often part of a, a, still part of a corporate structure. Like you'd have staff producers at a record label who would be assigned to work with a particular band. And then they would make records with that band still from a position of authority. Like they would still be calling the shots about how the sessions were going to go and how the music was going to be uh, presented and, you know, everything down to minor details about how fast the music was going to be, how, uh, you know, how intense or how aggressive, those would all be decisions that the producer would be responsible for, right? Then those producers sort of broke away from the ind the industrial mold or the, the corporate mold, and you started to have independent producers who would be chosen by the band rather than chosen by the record label and assigned to the band. And those independent producers were 
trading on their resume. Like they've done these successful records. And if you wanted to use them, you would have to uh, up, sort of appeal to that producer and hire, and that producer would deign to work on your record. Uh, and then he would be paid independent from the corporate structure of the record label. He'd have to negotiate his own deal with the record label. Um, then carrying on after that, there became these sort of self-contained producer artists um, you know, people like Stevie Wonder and, and Prince and people like that, um, who would create all of their own music, produce all of their own music, and they really didn't need um, a producer, but there would be a titular producer who would be sort of a business manager for the session or would be sort of a, an executive producer for the, the sessions. And then there were independent producers who would create entire backing tracks and this became much more of a thing during the hip hop, you know, from the hip hop era onward, where producers would create entirely finished backing tracks and they could essentially just superimpose an artist on top of these finished backing tracks, where the producer was essentially everything about the record other than the, the person whose name was on the cover. Like you'd have this, the star whose name was on the cover and then the producer did literally everything else. Uh, and and then there are people who are simply sort of glorified recording engineers where um, all they did was, you know, a few adjustments in the session to make the session move smoothly, but there wasn't really anything to call them. So they would get called a, a producer. And whenever I'm called a producer, it's generally in that capacity. Like I'm a recording engineer and I help out in the studio typically uh, in service of the aesthetic of the of the band not part of the corporate structure not part of the the business entity that's releasing the record but working more in tandem with the band on their aesthetic and i don't really feel like i qualify as a producer because of all of those descriptions that i've given you about how a producer behaves i don't do any of that you know um, a band shows up in the studio and they have their music prepared and ready to go. I'm not going to sit there with a clipboard and go through each song and tell them, you know, how, what the tempo changes should be in their song or, uh, you know, suggest that we bring in an orchestra at some point. Like those are, those creative decisions are all part of the band's world in, in, in my understanding of my role as an engineer. So in a real sense, the, the producer, the actual producer of any of these sessions that I've done historically, the producer has been the band or the, the person whose name is on the cover of the record. And uh, I'm just a facilitator. And that, you know, that does a number of things to the dynamic within the session it makes that those people the band the, the band members it makes them responsible for their for their own record like if they want to do something bold and if they want to do something that's atypical or that scratches some particular itch for themselves i'm not going to tell them no i try very hard not to say no in the studio um it also means that if there is a if there's a good response to their record like if there's if their record is received well then they can appreciate that. They can take 100% of that pride for themselves. There isn't somebody else, you know, who slides into the frame and says, yeah, that's because I suggested reverb, you know, like there, there, there isn't anybody, anybody who's going to like siphon off any of their glory, you know. That's a big part of what drove the music business during the record label era was that various people up and down the, the ladder wanted to claim authorship of success or in another manner, they wanted to be able to lay blame for a failure. They wanted to be able to say, well, you know, that record was going to be great, except that we use this one guy to, to uh, we use this mastering engineer and he just really ruined it. You know, they want to be able to lay blame for a failure in, as well as be able to say, well, that record was going to go into the toilet until I suggested that they use this producer, you know, like things like that. And I, I just, I don't want to be a part of any of those conversations. My relationship is with the band and their relationship is with their audience. And I want it to be as, as smooth and as easy a, 
uh, a process for them to make a record to suit them and their audience. And I don't want them to be concerned about me and what I have to say about it at all. I don't want my, my thoughts and opinions really to be on their mind at all. So do you find that the performances that the bands deliver based on, on that dynamic that you, that you maintain with the band, do you find that the performances are different when, uh, when you, you're, the, you're the incumbent producer, but you're the engineer and there is no label producer as opposed to somebody, if there is a producer on site, do you find that the, per, uh, the band's performances are changing? Well, I mean, I have to say, I, I'm, it's pretty rare that I'm in a situation where there's a titular producer and I'm an engineer in that scenario. It's super, it's pretty rare. So I don't, I can't really evaluate whether my way of doing things is supreme or whatever. All I know is that it's very comfortable and that um, I can work at much greater efficiency. That is, um, if a band would, under normal circumstances, working with a producer through a hierarchy and a, and a chain of command, it might take them six weeks to make a record. I can make a similar record in one or two weeks. Um, and that efficiency translates to less money spent on the band's behalf and more so they get to keep more of their, more of their money. Like they, they get to keep more of the money that they earn. Um, I also know that there, are, there have been historically tensions between producers and band members where, or artists where um, <clears throat> the relationships can be quite contentious and eventually they have a falling out or they come to blows or, um, you know, someone can feel like someone has tried to tank them, tank their career or saddle them with a record that they're unhappy with historically, that sort of thing. And I know I've never had any of those problems. So um, I can't say that the way I do things is categorically better. I can say that having seen a few producers in action, I have no ambitions in that regard. Like I don't want to behave like that. Um, and, and having worked for a long time, often with repeated, repeating clients, like as clients that have come back again and again, I know that this, this way of doing things works smoothly and it, and it doesn't create these areas of tension or discomfort that I know have been problems in other people's relationships. So, so while I can't, say that I have the evidence that my way of doing things is the best way of doing things. I can say that it's a very good way of doing things and it has proven to be uh, sort of long-term comfortable and viable. So, and you're doing everything still analog? My sessions are analog. Yeah. The studio uh -huh. as a whole, it's a commercial studio. It has to be available for everybody. So the majority of other sessions that are done here are either digital sessions or hybrid sessions, but the sessions that I conduct for my own clients, <clears throat> those are all in the analog domain. Right. And, and very, so very rarely there's a thing where there, you have to, somebody will start a session at home using a digital session and they'll want to bring that into the studio and embellish it. Or uh, there'll be a session that's done in a, some kind of a, an absurd setting where it would be impossible to record in an analog domain. So they record the, some aspect of it on location in a digital setting and then bring that to the studio and elaborate it on, on it there. That, that sort of thing happens not infrequently, but um, if I was just doing a standard session where the band comes in in the morning, we make a record and they leave in the evening with a finished product, then it's all gonna be on tape. It's all gonna be an analog session. Do, do you find that the process uh, the analog process, uh, if, you, if you have an artist that's used to working in uh, Pro Tools where wait times are drastically reduced and you're working with, say, with an artist, a vocalist or, or whoever, do you find that there's a change in the dynamic with the artist because of the necessary pacing change that you're, you're recording, you're stopping, you have to zzz, 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 wind back? and then you're dropping back in, do you find that there's a 
uh, it, that artists that are used to working at the like the sort of the hyper pace of Pro Tools, do you find that there's a uh, there's a benefit to the to that the analog that time where you have to you can stop and breathe and think about what well, you're going to be doing? Well, I, I mean, I'm trying to I'm trying to resolve your question, uh, but in my experience, the analog sessions. W- run much more smoothly and go faster than digital sessions. Um, in digital sessions, there are, <clears throat> there are countless opportunities to stop and fix things or stop and fiddle with things. So um, you can be in the flow of work and then um, you have to, you know, there are a lot of opportunities to edit things together or move things around and reorganize things. And there are often uh, sort of dead, points in the workflow where you have to, um, rather than just rolling to the next song on the reel, you have to call up another session and reconfigure a lot of things in order to get back to work on the next song or whatever. So the complexity of digital sessions engenders a lot of downtime of its own, during which time the engineer might be quite busy, but everyone else in the room is just watching them fuck around on the computer, you know, uh, rather than playing music or whatever. In my experience, the efficiency of an analog session is probably is one of its principal selling points. Um, In the digital domain, it's not uncommon to generate 10, 20, 40, 70, 100 takes of something And then there is a massive editorial juggernaut of trying to find the best bits of the best bits to assemble into a simulacrum of a performance, you know, Uh, and that essentially doesn't happen in the analog domain. Like you do a take and if you like it, you keep it. If you don't like it, you punch in on the part that you don't like until you like it and then you move on, you know, and then it's a settled matter and you don't ever have to revisit it. You don't ever have to worry about, you know, a decision previously made becoming undone, either accidentally or intentionally. And also the, the sort of constructive process of analog recording is such that once you've made some decisions and built a master, there's no chance that they can ever change again. There's no chance that a, a glitch of any kind can undo any of your work. Um, it's there on tape for a hundred years or more. And uh, that's the most reassuring part of it like knowing that if you come back to a session in a hundred years that it's going to sound exactly the same as it did when you left it rather than hoping that all of your stuff came back the way it was supposed to and there hasn't been some uh some bug somewhere that has cropped up you know or some license has expired and you no longer have a plug-in you thought you did that sort of thing (laughs) i've seen that happen a lot (laughs) Yeah, I, I own a studio. I've seen it happen all the time. <laughs> so, so, Steve, I got to jump in here. I got to ask. I'm just curious. Do you ever, I mean, is it ever just a tiny amount of doubt that maybe you're missing something? Like, you know, you're, you're in a situation where you're, you're, you're a, a very small minority. and Everybody's doing something. Isn't there, is there any little doubt that says, mm, maybe I should jump on this digital train? Well, I mean, the way you phrase that implies that I'm, I'm like a monk in some <laughs> monastery somewhere and I don't know about the outside world. Um, but I, I'm in a recording studio every day. I am seeing sessions underway every day. Whether they're my sessions or not, I am observing and interacting with people who are doing things in the digital domain constantly. Every other member of the staff is struggling with all of the problems with their digital sessions. And, uh, and I occasionally work on sessions, like I said, in a hybrid manner where there may be a Pro Tools engineer working on the Pro Tools portion of it, and I'm working on the um, acoustic side of it or the analog side of it. So I'm not operating from a position of ignorance. Like I see how powerful these tools are, and I am impressed by the power of the tools. But uh, I also understand that that's a shift in responsibility where in the analog domain, you try to make things sound good and then record them. 
And then there are a limited number of things you can do once they've been recorded to improve or adjust them, right? In the digital world, the recording part of it is seen as almost an afterthought, it's almost like a trivial obligation. Like, well, I guess we'll record a drum kit and then somewhere, you know, I can, you know, I have a hundred drum kits in here. I can swap out if I need to, you know? So the, the process ends up becoming more editorial in the digital domain where you're doing more editing and manipulating and processing than you are just the basic task of recording a sound, you know? And so the most skilled digital engineers are making maximum use of those most powerful tools, right? Uh, and that means that the, rec the basic recording, that is the sound that's generated by the artist in the studio, will have less and less relationship to the finished product because the, the process is going to be more about editing and manipulating and changing and embellishing these fundamental recordings. And it's going to be less and less about the basic performance and the arrangement and the, and the, the, the song as it walked in through the front door, right? And so that suits someone with a producer's mentality, the mentality that I described previously where someone wanted to maintain authorial control over the music of someone else, right? And I, I have no ambitions in that regard. Like I'm, I'm happy to let the people that I work with, the bands make their decisions about their music. And it is true that a lot of people, their principal experience with music is in the digital realm. And so they, in some cases come to rely on some certain tricks or, or aspects of the record of digital recording, which are unique to digital recording. Um, most of them have, an analog in the analog world. Like if I've, I see some people who have a mistaken notion of analog recording that they cannot correct their mistakes, for example. Like if you do a take and it has a mistake in it, you just have to live with it. And, and that's absolutely not true. Or that if you do a take of a song and you're 90% happy with it, but you wanna try another take to see if you can get to 100%, there are people who assume that that comparative thing is impossible and it it's totally that's not true those are those are misunderstandings about the analog domain that are are just born of inexperience like people not having any experience with it almost all things that are done in the digital domain have an analog counterpart or they were developed in the analog domain first and then applied to digital recording like the obvious one being editing. Like when you edit something, you cut and paste it, right? And it's called cutting and pasting because you literally, in the analog domain, you literally cut a piece of tape out and you paste it in place to where, to where, where you want it to be. And that's, that's not as, it's not as obvious that that's even possible until you see it done in front of you and you realize, oh yeah, that's just a, a standard tool. So I, I guess what I'm saying is, no, I never feel limited by analog techniques. Um, but I can understand someone whose only appreciation or only experience in music has been in this manipulative, heavily manipulative world of the digital realm. I can understand someone in that who, who grew up in that environment um, feeling like there were limitations to the analog technique. My job as an engineer is to make what limitations there are irrelevant to the client. Like the, the band, the client should never care that it's an analog session. It shouldn't matter to them at all. They should be able to make the kind of record that they want, however they want to make it. And my job is to make that happen, you know. So um, let me ask you, do you find the, uh, like if I get in sessions to mix, let's say, 10 years ago, I would get, I would get more or less what would be considered uh, like an analog multi-track. I would get X amount of guitars. I would have drums, totally typical analog style recording. Now in the, in the, in the space of 10 years, what I've found is when uh, there's an expectation, say, to remix what I get 
would be the uh, the MIDI from the drums. I would get DI'd guitars and DI'd bass, and it's literally tune the vocal, make a guitar sound. So either reamp or you know whatever. It, the, uh, I'm finding that the process has completely changed from what uh, from what say amp, the whole process of mixing amp, you know Studer SSL or or a console of your choice that it's completely changed. Are you seeing any of that, uh, uh, any of those expectations or, or do you just find that the clients are coming to you specifically because of the analog heritage and they're not interested in, in that part of the uh, way the industry is going? It's not uncommon to see sessions that operate that way. <clears throat> sessions that I work on, obviously sessions that I'm doing start to finish are not gonna behave that way. Um, I do occasionally get requests to mix other people's recordings. Um, I used to blanket just refuse to do it, not in a snotty way, but just because I feel like my, my understanding, my comprehension of a session usually has to start at the beginning. And if I wasn't there when the decisions were being made about, you know, why does the snare drum sound like that? That sounds weird. Why, you know, but if there was a conversation had about why the snare drum sounds like that, then I would understand it and I, and, and it wouldn't be on my mind anymore, you know, or, uh, you know, like something might sound out of place to me, might sound out of character to me, but if I was there while it was being done, I would understand that that was an aesthetic choice and it was valid and it wasn't a problem. But uh, because I'm coming in at the last minute, I don't know this sort of the sort of oral tr history of the session. So I used to feel so limited by that that I was unwilling to try to mix other people's recordings because I, I just felt baffled by them, you know. Um, now, I, I mean, as, as a purely practical matter, um, especially during the quarantine, like, I'm not in a position to turn down work. So if somebody comes to me and wants me to remix their record, I'll remix their record. If they want me to detail their van, I'll detail their van. You know, if they, <laughs> if they, if they want me to shingle their roof, I'll shingle their roof. Like I'm, I'm not really, I'm not precious about my reputation as it were. So um, I do get sessions in now where the tracking was done in, um, as you're describing in a sort of a digital paradigm. Um, I haven't yet run into the purely synthetic drummer, purely synthetic guitar sound kind of scenario. Although, uh, I, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if that turned up eventually, but I haven't, haven't run across that yet as, a, as an engineer. Uh, <clears throat> organizing sessions now, like it, it's not uncommon for a song to be broken down to the extent that every section of every song will have a kind of an orchestration of sounds on it. And, and if each of those is a, has a different name and each of those is discontinuous with the rest of the session, you could end up with hundreds and hundreds of individual sound files. But if you organize them somewhat, there actually is a thread of continuity. Oh, you have guitars at the beginning, guitars in the middle and guitars at the end you could just call that one guitar part. And instead of calling it three guitar parts, let's just call that one guitar part, you know? And so before I get involved in anything in working on a session that is assembled in this manner, I like try to, re try to organize it in a way that makes more intuitive sense to me so that um, I have a more manageable number of tracks to, to maintain and I have a, a more conventional workflow or a, a workflow that's more conventional to the analog methods. And I, I still mix through the desk. I'm, I'm not mixing in the box. I'm still using the workflow that has, I've developed over 30 years. So Christ, 40 years. Uh, I just realized how old I was, sorry. It, I know it adds up. It adds up after a while. So, are you doing any? Uh, are you doing any other or any multi-channel work at all, or is it strictly? Or do you just do stereo? Are you are you doing anything I mean, in five one or is that? There, 
when we built the studio, we started building the studio in uh, nine, 1996. 1990, yeah, we bought the building in 95 and we started building it in 96. So uh, when we built the studio, we wanted to maintain capacity for 5.1 surround and potentially even 7.1 surround because we didn't know how the industry was gonna progress and if that was gonna become a standard listening format. All that shit has died. Like literally the only functionality any of that has is for film soundtrack work. And generally speaking, the music is not presented in 5.1. Music is presented as a mono element or as a stereo element within a 5.1 surround matrix that the, the film is in. Um, there are some gaming platforms that use surround sound. And, but generally speaking, that music is kind of uh, generative music where the, the music has to be uh, built into the, the game flow. So it's not just a static piece of music that plays from beginning to end. It's uh, music that's dynamically evolving as the game progresses. So, um, and the audio for game systems like that has to be integrated into the game as the game is written. So generally speaking, all the game studios have their own music studios that work in tandem with the game developers. Uh, so when they're coding the game, they're also working on the, the, the musical elements simultaneously with that. So we don't get, we don't get any of that business. Um, there, there just really isn't, there really isn't any demand for multi-channel music. I guess probably the nearest thing is there are some, <clears throat> there are some video games where actively playing the music is part of the game where, you know, you have like rock band and um, what's it, guitar hero and things like that, where you're separating out individual elements of the music and those become a kind of a competitive thing within the game. And we have been asked to deliver stems of music where you have the drum track, the, the bass guitar, the electric guitar, the vocals, like as discrete elements mm -hmm. that when summed synthesize the, the master recording. We've been asked to deliver that a few times, but only a few times. They're just there. Yeah. There just really isn't that much like in a normal day, if you're listening to music, you're going to hear, listen to it on your earbuds, or you're going to listen to it on your smart speaker, or you're going to listen at home. You'll listen to it on your hi-fi speakers. And there, you know, there just isn't that much call for surround entertainment for music using music. Cool. Cool. So, so let me, let me ask you as far as it, all of the, uh, all the gear that's in the analog world. Um, what's your, what's your take on the state of emulating, whether it's like right, right now there's, I mean, I can't tell you how many versions of say SSL uh, SSL EQs are the SSL sure. Neves. So what's your, what's your take on the, uh, on the state of the, uh, plug-in quality versus all the analog equipment you're using? I've never directly compared like a plug-in version of an item with a hardware version of that item because making such comparisons is very difficult. Like you have to interrupt the digital workflow in order to insert an analog element. You know, you have to go through a converter and into the analog world and then back into the digital world and recapture it and then resynchronize it. And then you can do it. It's like, super fiddly to make any of these comparisons, right? So I've never done it. And I also know that like every hardware item, especially from the classic era, like let's say you've got half a dozen LA-2A compressors, every single one of them is gonna sound different. So you could easily convince me that the model of an LA-2A compressor that I'm listening to on a platform, you could easily convince me that that was identical to one particular LA-2A compressor if you compared it, right? But there's probably more variation between different hardware units of the same item than there is between um, an emulation and the real world. And the the practical aspect of the digital system, meaning that you're not actually driving an electronic circuit, right? You're just doing math on it, means 
that the system could be emulating a sound quality, but it's not doing the same things within the unit that the analog version would. And so the, the end result will be different. It could be pleasing and it could have maintained certain aspects of the sound quality that you wanted. But um, if you knew, for example, that if you overdrive a certain element of an analog piece of equipment, it will behave a certain way. Chances are that if you overdrive that in the digital domain, it won't behave the same way because it's not really doing what it purports to be doing. It's, it's mimicking the effect of something. Um, I've never, like I said, I've never really compared the, I've never had reason to compare the analog versus the hardware versions of emulations. I have heard some recordings that were like home recordings where people used an amp modeler, for example, rather than using an amplifier. And for, you know, some utilitarian stuff where the sound quality isn't critical, I think it sounds fine, you know. Um, but I, I can say that I've never heard a, anything, that, anything that impressed me as a great recording that was not actually a recording, but was instead a, a synthesis or a model of something. Right. How about um, room, room ambience versus uh, algorithmic uh, sort of uh, plug-in reverb type stuff? Yeah, that's another thing that can be credible on a single sound. Like if you have a, a solo voice and you put an, a hall echo on it, that's a, um, you know, uh, that is a, a, a realistic model of an acoustic space, then that can be credible on that one element. Um, but generally speaking, the ambient character of a recording comes from a bunch of musicians playing together in the same studio, and they're all sharing the space in three dimensions. And so the ambient sound is influenced by localization cues from the direct signal and, that, and from phase interactions of the different sounds coming at from different angles in the studio and <clears throat> different near wall reflections and that sort of thing. And I've never heard a synthesized ambience on an ensemble that sounded credible to me. Um, like I've never heard a recording that was done in a studio and then reverb was added and it, and they convinced me that it was done in, you know, a great hall or something. Like I've, I've, I've never heard that. But on an individual song, an individual element, like you put reverb on the vocal, you can credibly make it, you know, you can evoke the sensation of that vocal being in a big space, for example. But then when that's collapsed into a mix with other elements, often what it ends up being is just like a nice sustain on the vocal that doesn't have an ambient character. There's a psychological or psychoacoustic effect, um, which is a real problem with synthesized ambience. Um, our brains have evolved as a kind of, as part of our normal evolution, our brains have evolved the ability to resolve a sense of space. Like when I'm speaking in this room, I'm hearing reflected sound off the side walls and off the ceiling. And that gives me uh, a sense of the size of this room. And if the, if, if the room were suddenly smaller, I would know it not from bumping into anything, but because the acoustic cues that were coming back from me speaking would indicate a smaller space. Like, so we've evolved the ability to discern our sense of place from these acoustic cues. There are people who are very good at echolocating, blind people or, hear, or sight impaired people who can, um, just by making sounds, either like snapping their fingers or clicking their tongues, they can echolocate and they can re like resolve their location within a room and manage going through a day without having to use a cane, for example. And that's an aspect, that's, that's a, um, a higher, more highly developed um, use or utility for a sense that we all have. We all have this sense of space associated with acoustic reflections. So what reverb does is it, it uses that evolved sense to simulate a sense of size or space on a sound. 
you hear a sound, you hear a reverberant echo, your brain resolves that you are now in a large space with this sound and that's what you're hearing, right? Uh, and that works uh, insofar as you have a single sound and a single set of reverberant cues. <clears throat> the moment you collapse that into a, a complex environment where you have natural ambience, for example, on the drum kit that's a result of the, the overhead microphones and the room microphones, an artificial reverb on the guitar amplifier or an echo effect on the keyboard, or you have backing vocals with a long reverb and the lead vocal with a short slap back on it. Once you have all of these ambient cues competing with each other, your brain cannot resolve them all simultaneously. You're, there is no acoustic environment that could have trained your brain to perceive being in a small space and a large space simultaneously. So what happens is your brain just ignores the majority of those acoustic cues and it can occasionally focus on one of them and say, okay, well now I can tell that we're in this big room because there's this long sustaining echo on the vocal. But then when the vocal goes away, okay, now I sense a smaller sense of, of space um, because this drum kit has reverb on it and there's a, a sort of a, a smaller sense of space on the drum kit, but I no longer feel like I'm in this large space. And now, oh, the vocal has come back now and it has a long echo on it. And so for a moment, my brain is confused and then it resolves this large space, but forgets about the small space. So there, <clears throat> when you have a, a number of synthesized ambient effects on top of each other, what happens is that your brain ignores most of them, settles on resolving one of them, typically the dominant one, the loudest one, or the one with the, the, the wettest mix. And the other reverberant effects or the other ambient effects that you've used become tonal shaping devices. Like they have an effect on the tonal quality of the music, but the ambient quality that was your reason for using them has, ev has evaporated. And it only ever comes back if you solo up the drum kit or if you solo up the vocalist. Then you're reminded, oh yeah, we put that long reverb on the vocal and it sounded great, but I can't really hear it in the mix. Or, uh, oh yeah, we had that nice room sound on the piano, but I can't really hear it in the mix, uh, you know. And so a, a lot of the job of managing these ambient effects is understanding the trade-off between being able to resolve an ambient character on an individual element and having an overall ambient quality to an ensemble presentation. You know, one of the, you know, the, the classic ensemble recordings that everybody talks about as being like the standards, um, things like the, the blue note recordings, for example, where there's an, a, a palpable sense of, of, stereo imaging in the room like you can feel that there's a drum kit over here and that there's vibes over here and there's a string bass in the back right there like you you get that sensation because your brain is capable of re resolving these ambient cues because they were a simultaneous performance in an individual space <clears throat> and all the localization cues are presented to you in a consistent way um, as productions got more elaborate you start to lose that sense of uh, ensemble. You start to lose that sense of location. Uh, and, and part of your job as a recording engineer is understanding what is going to disappear if you do something, understanding what you're losing when you're trying to add something else. And, and ambient effects are probably the biggest um, bear trap that you can step into in that regard. Like you'll synthesize what you think is a nice ambient sound on an element. And then when you drop it into the mix, you can't, it's obliterated. You can't tell it's there at all. And that's because there are other competing ambient cues, which are more significant to your brain. <clears throat> Ray? Oh, okay. I mean, I could, I could keep following up on that one. Um, what about, um, you like to do, uh, you, you talk about the ensemble recording. And I think you, you favor that or you, you really enjoy doing that. Uh, but there's a trade-off, right? I mean, if you, if you go for the more conventional recording 
methodology, which is, you know, small number of tracks at a time or even single track at a time, you get that separation. If you do the ensemble recording, you don't get that separation. So how do you, what's the, what's the, how do you weigh those two? And how do you, how do you manage the, the need for isolation in some, in some cases? Well, I mean, a lot of that is a, <clears throat> a, a lot of the practical session management stuff is just, you know, dumb, dumb common sense. Like if you have a wailing guitar amplifier, you can't put that next to a very quiet cellist and expect the two of them to cohabit very well. So you, you organize the session so that they're, the sounds that will compete with each other are pr pr protected in some way. Either in our, at our studio, we typically have the, the drum kit in one room and the electric instruments in, the other, in another room. And if there is a third element, like if there's a, a, a quiet element that needs to compete with those loud elements, uh, then we'll isolate that quiet element either in a booth or in a third room. So for example, one not, not uncommon scenario is to have <clears throat> uh, like an acoustic rhythm guitar, uh, a violin as a lead instrument, uh, an electric rhythm section that's a bass kit, a, a, a drum kit, a bass guitar, and an electric guitar. So for, I mean, I'll just use our studios as an example. So in Studio A, for example, we would isolate the drum kit in one room we would have the amplifiers and the electric instruments in another room and the acoustic instruments in a third room. So that way you could use the ambient effect. You could use the ambient sound quality of each of those instruments um, without having them impinge on each other. <clears throat> so you can, you can have the microphone at a, a little bit of a distance from the violin. So you don't have a very a dry, scratchy up close violin sound you can have a nice airy violin sound but you couldn't do that if there was an electric guitar and a bass amplifier in the room at the same time because it, then that distant microphone would then just pick up the bass guitar and the electric guitar <clears throat> or another very common one is when you have piano and a drum kit at the same time if the piano and the trap set are are three feet from each other in the same room and the mouth of the piano is open and you have mics, you know, 18 inches away from the hammers and the piano, those mics are going to be hearing the drum kit. There's just no way around it. And so your, <clears throat> your job then is to figure out if that is tenable, like, okay, if the piano player ever needs to do a correction on a piano part and you drop in the piano for a verse, for example, it's going to radically change the sound of the drum kit that you've been listening to up to that point. And if you, if that is a possibility, then you need to defend against that by isolating the piano away from the drum kit or isolating the drum kit away from the piano one way or the other. <laughs> so all of that is sort of session management. It's not, there's no ray gun that you can use after the fact to remove the drum kit from the piano. So speaking to your point about the, uh, uh, the concept of uh, single, like a, a, your, your ears being able to correlate uh, better with a, a single ambience, so to speak. Uh, yep. Do you ever, it, it sounds like you're, if you're still using the sort of the ISO room concept, everybody playing at the same time, but the, you're using ISO, ISO booths to separate, There's, you're still gonna get, I think you would still get the ambience. Uh, there'd be a differential of ambience. So your drummer would be in the live room, your piano player's in a, dead room so you're still going to get these changes do you ever say at at uh during mix phase do you say hey you know what i'm going to i have a speaker set up where i actually i fire elements of the mix say the piano i fire these back into say where the drums were set up to just to create that common ambience uh, yeah to get the, I, to correlate I, more i have experimented with that like um when i had more time on my hands. Um, I experimented with things like that. Uh, it has very rarely become been useful. Where it has been most useful <clears throat> has been when there's a purely electronic element and the purely electronic element sounds out of place in an acoustic ensemble or, or an acoustically recorded ensemble. Um, so, and that, uh, that's often a synthesizer or keyboard patch. 
And uh, you can go a long way toward making something like that sound less phony just by generating some very simple ambient cue for it, even if it's just to resolve a stereo image where you have a dry sound on one side and the ambient sound on the other side. Even that much um, will often take something out of this uncanny valley where it's, you know, it sounds like it's supposed to be a real instrument, except that it's, you know, transparently fake, you know. Th those are, yeah, I, I have done that on occasion. It's pretty rare. Um, and it's definitely not a panacea. It definitely doesn't, it's definitely not the case that you can have a, a great hall and just pump individual elements into the great hall and record that ambience. And then they sound like they were playing in the great hall. It, just, it doesn't work that way. Um, I'm going to ask a, a, a question about technology because we're, we're, you know, we're getting towards the end here. Um, today, as you know, uh, Steve, um, a kid can buy a laptop. Uh, it might come with even a DAW. He buys a sound card. He sits at home. He spends many years, you know, getting better at what he does. And age of 14, 15, 16, makes some pretty convincing music. Yeah. And of course, it's happened many times. And, and what, what kind of merit do you see in that uh, sort of technology and, and the sort of democratization of making music, especially for young people? On a cultural level, I think it's fantastic. You know, like, the, I think it's incredible that somebody can use these very simple tools and learn to express themselves and, and get in the, in the habit of creating uh, in, in that way. I think, it's, I think it's fantastic. There have been, you know, there have been sort of breakthrough moments where people who do things in this kind of bedroom fashion become superstars. You know, you have people like Billie Eilish, whose music is literally made on a, a laptop at home. And, you know, she's a, a huge star now. And, or, and you have bands like, well, there's a, a band called Sleaford Mods in England who are one of the biggest pop bands in England at the moment. And it's just literally just two guys on a laptop. Like, that's, that's the whole band. And uh, I'm, I'm very much buoyed by the idea that, <clears throat> that this is now a, an avenue that people can use to get their music out into the world. And it, it removes all of the obstacles that used to exist between someone having an, a great idea and finding an audience with it. You know, I, I, think it's, I think it's fantastic. I really love it. It doesn't have a lot of utility in my world, in, in my professional life where my, I mean, what I do for a living is I record musicians performing their music together. Uh, you know, I record musicians performing as an ensemble or, um, music that can at least be performed live, you know, but there's an entire, there's, there are whole other spheres of music where the music is never intended to be performed live. It's just music that's constructed <clears throat> piecemeal to be a satisfying thing on its own. And I, I think that's perfectly valid. It's not, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not one of those people who thinks that if there's no drum kit, it's not real music, you know. And and you know, Imsta, we have a um, we represent the music software manufacturers, and uh, we you know we try to promote the legal use of software, and we have this buy the software we use. And I remember you made a great uh, speech in Chicago, and I, and I just want you to speak to to some of the things that we're trying to do, and speak to our manufacturers directly about what you uh, you know what what your take is on that. Well, the the my world my professional world is pretty disparate from the world of someone who sits at home using their computer and software to make music that's only ever going to exist inside that framework. You know, most of what I do is taking performing musicians, bands who play on stage and make permanent recordings of music that they were doing anyway. And the utility of the software recording stuff is more about generating music from nothing. It's more about taking a platform and using those tools to build music out of thin air, right? <clears throat> so those tools and those platforms have very little use or very little utility for me. Um, I was recently in a conference on an AES section conversation about the use of AI in music. 
and uh, the panel, the other panelists were software developers who were developing products to sell using AI, uh, an academic researcher who um, had a, as an expressed intent furthering the use of AI in all aspects of life, but in a sort of responsible fashion. And then me, a guy who doesn't make records on computers at all, right? So my exposure to AI has been these clumsy moments where, um, you know, you're sending a text to someone and your autocorrect changes Virginia to vagina for no reason, you know. <clears throat> um, while I was, while I was on this conference on this zoom conference or this zoom section meeting i got a text from a friend of mine who was telling me that his father had passed away and um he said he was telling me because i was one of the few people that got to meet him in real life meaning that where his dad wasn't just a figure that he described me but i'd actually met his dad <clears throat> And there was a, an autocorrect typo in the middle of his text to me, telling me this terrible heartbreaking news that made his text like unreadable. Like I, it was incomprehensible. And so my exposure and my experience to um, machine learning and machine decision-making is limited into those areas of life where it can be clumsy and awful, right? And my, my association with music is such that my, the music that I love the most is music that, it, that baffles me, that confuses me, that defies my expectation, right? There's a band called Black Midi that I, I'm a big fan of, and their music is extremely unpredictable. Uh, I guess you don't need to say extremely. Their music is unpredictable. Like you can be, they can be tooling along on a groove that you think is sort of setting the pace for the song. And then the scene breaks in an uncharacteristic way and in an unexpected way. And you're startled for a moment and baffled. And then you start to evolve your appreciation into this new moment that you've just been dropped into, right? That for me is a supreme moment in music when I'm confused by the music that I'm enjoying. Um, and AI is predicated on the notion that the machine can learn what I like or learn what I'm expecting and give me that. That is that that machine could program out the moments of joy that mean the most to me in music, the baffling moments, the music, the thing that things that are unexpected. And it, to a lesser extent, non-AI technology, when it becomes sufficiently powerful, that technology argues for the mundane. It argues for standard solutions, you know, things that were once rare and difficult to obtain. For example, Fairchild compressors, can now become ubiquitous and you can have 700 Fairchild compressor instances on your session. Uh, so the, the danger in technology is not the power that the technology has, which can be misused by a person, but that the natural flow of the use of technology argues for banality and conformity and the mundane and it argues against the unexpected and the accidental and the perverse uh, so my only advice to music technology people is to be very careful when you automate the process of making something prettier or regulating something it's now 
kind of normal for people to tune their vocals in the studio to the extent that one vocalist is just as good as another for a lot of utilitarian tasks. It could be anybody. And I think that that is that as tools become more powerful, you run the risk of reducing essentially everyone to interchangeable elements because the quirks and the idiosyncrasies and the oddities that make, make us able to discern the difference between one person and another, <clears throat> those disappear. I was reminded the other day, somebody posted something the other day. It was uh, the Stevie Wonder song, Superstition, which for my money is the, the best rhythm track that has ever been made. There's a single element that repeats throughout the whole song, which is the syncopated clavinet and rhythm guitar that are the sort of signature riff of the song. And that repeats for the duration of the song. And if you listen to any random bar of that riff, that riff is repeated, I don't know, 1800 times, whatever. If you listen to any one of them, each one of them will be slightly different from the previous bars. Like whether the upbeat is being accented or the rhythm guitar downbeat or the, the tonic bass note, like just the way that the shape of the first three or four notes varies pretty dramatically over the course of the song. And that's the thing that keeps drawing you into it. it keeps in, you know, you, you feel like you're hearing this familiar thing differently every time, right? I can imagine a world where someone came up with that same syncopated riff now, managed to play it perfectly once, and then looped it for the duration of the track. And I can imagine a world where instead of me thinking that superstition is the greatest piece of recorded music ever devised, to thinking that it's just another mundane backing track that, you know, might be suitable for a perfume, a perfume, perfume commercial or something, you know. You might be able to sell cars with it, but you certainly wouldn't build your life around it. And that's, that's I think, that's the danger of having very powerful technology, is that it prevents the, the or just the natural utility of it argues against the irregularities and the perversities that make music brilliant rather than it, than delivering what is expected. Well, a lot of people would say, and, I, and I, I'm included in that, this started with the quantized button back in 1984 or somewhere. The music started being quantized. You lost a lot of the, um, the rhythmic character, the individuality of, of, of the players, of the singers. Yeah, I mean, when you say that, you're, you're sort of offloading the blame onto the person who pushes the button. And what I'm saying is that when this technology exists and is sufficiently powerful to regularize things, its value comes from its use, meaning that it's only useful, it's only a reason, it, the, that technology only exists because people want to use it. And so if you create a tool that argues for the mundane, argues for the regular, argues for the nondescript, you will get an enormous amount of mundane, regular, nondescript music because the tool you've created argues for it. So what's the technological solution to that, Steve? Uh, this isn't my problem. <laughs> I don't have to come up with a solution. This isn't my problem. It's like me walking up to a bridge and the bridge is fucking collapsing and they say, Steve, how do we keep this bridge from, from collapsing? I didn't fucking build it. You know, it's not my bridge. Maybe, maybe AI that's tuned to like constantly make variations. Um, but I, I'm, I'm going to throw another one of these questions out here because um, there are a lot of young people getting in the industry, Steve, mm -hmm. and they want to be where you are. They want to be in that place where they created a body of work that they're proud of, that they've got the, the recognition of, the, of their peers, uh, and they made a living at it. And uh, they get told over and over again that this is one of the hardest industries to get in. Uh, you can't make it. Uh, it's tough, blah, blah, blah. What's your advice to that, that person watching you right now? Well, 
there are two things, two aspects to that. One of them is I, I want to make music for my whole life. That's the main one is I want to be in, I want to, I want to, from now until I die, I want to be involved in music. I want to be making music. And I, I want that in my life. The other one is I want to make a living. I need to make a living from, from here until the end of my life. I want to live comfortably and without fear. I don't want to be starving. I don't want to be broke all the time. I don't want to have to be at risk. I, don't, I want to be able to have a normal family life and the, the normal trappings of society without being broke all the time. Right? Those, those two things. If you're comfortable divorcing those two things from each other, if you're comfortable having those be two separate problems that you solve, then I, I guarantee you that you can play music for the rest of your life. And I guarantee you that you can make a living, right? The, it becomes a problem if you insist on having those two bound together. If you insist on being a professional musician where your livelihood comes from music, then there are vanishingly few opportunities for that. You can do it. It's a lot of work. It's way more work than having a job, but it's possible. But you need to be hustling all the time. You need to take every gig that comes your way. You need to, you'll end up playing on a bunch of garbage that you really aren't, don't respect. And you, you'll end up doing gigs that mean nothing to you, but you have to do them to pay the, pay the rent or whatever. <clears throat> if you can, if you're comfortable separating those two things, like, I've played music my whole life. I've never tried to make playing music pay my rent. Like the band that I'm in now, I've been in for 25 years. We put out records now and again. We tour now and again. We do everything that, everything that makes being in a band great. We get to do all of that. We get to tour all over the country. We get to tour all over the world. We put out records whenever we want. You know, it's fantastic. I, I don't think I could make a living doing just that. If I tried to just do the band as my profession, I think I would live a really meager life and it would, it would suck. So what I've done is I've put the band in a position where I get to enjoy it. I get to enjoy the process of writing songs and rehearsing and playing shows and being on tour and making records. It's fucking fantastic. I love it. I love every second of it, right? And it does generate some income, and, and that income is part of my life, but I don't rely on it, right? It's like having another passion in your life. Let's say cooking is your passion, and you, you're really into cooking, and it, you, you, it's just this enormous world that you could delve into forever, and you, you enjoy cooking for other people, you enjoy learning about cooking, you enjoy learning new processes and techniques and, and you get deeper and deeper into it as you go. You can do that without being a chef, without having the, the obligations of running a business as well. You can cook like that in your home kitchen and get the world out of it, right? Without it being a professional obligation, without having to worry about the price of oysters or whatever the fuck, you know? So, Music has that role in my life. <clears throat> that is playing music has that role in my life. On a, as an engineer, um, the, the thing that matters most is that over time, I acquired more and more skills and was able to do better and better job for my clients over time. That is, I described the arc of my becoming a professional engineer is taking about eight or nine years. So over the course of eight or nine years, I was able to acquire the skill set and, and the tools that enabled me to be a professional engineer. It didn't happen like that. And the whole time I was doing that, the whole time I was learning the trade, I had a straight job. That is, I had a nine to five job that I would go to every day and that would pay my rent. <clears throat> so, um, I, I, I recommend this article often. There's an article written for, uh, I want to say the Austin Chronicle by Danny Barnes. Uh, Danny Barnes is in a band called the Bad Livers. They're a, a really cool sort of experimental bluegrass band. 
And uh, he wrote an article for the Austin Chronicle about the life of a professional musician. Like, what does it mean to be a professional musician? And a part of his advice to an aspiring professional musician is that you shouldn't feel belittled by having to have a job. Like, if you have a straight job that you can go to and that covers your essentials, uh, you know, covers your rent and your food and all that sort of stuff, and you get your health insurance or whatever. If you have all of that covered by your straight job, then the rest of your life is free, right? That by having a job, by having something to rely on to cover it, to pay your bills, you have created free time. It's not a drag on your free time. It's not an obligation on your free time. That, you know, that minimal investment of eight or eight hours a day or so, that purchases the whole rest of the calendar for you to do whatever it is that, it, that animates you and excites you. And in his case, it, he's explaining that you can be called to do music. You can be a musician primarily without that being the thing that pays your rent. And it's perfectly valid and you should feel no shame in it. And I would reiterate that. I think that whatever you do to pay the bills is none of my business. Uh, and what you do to pay the bills frees your mind and frees your hands and frees your time to work on your passions outside of that. And it's perfectly reasonable for you to get more out of your spare time and your part time and your pastime stuff than out of your job, your profession, your, your prof profession, your job, that can be garbage, you know, but it enables you to do all of this other stuff in the rest of your life. Uh, I mean, one parallel is something like, like dancing or, uh, ice skating or playing chess or bass fishing or something like that. These are all things that people do because they give them satisfaction. Just doing it is great, right? It doesn't have to be your profession in order for it to be great and awesome. Like you catch a big fish, you can be proud of catching a big fish without it being the, the number one trophy champion fish on ESPN or whatever. You know, you, your relationships with other people, those things are valuable. Those are a currency. Like, you, you know, you can be enriched by all of those relationships and you can make those relationships in the music scene. And you've bought the time to do that by having a straight job that you do. You know, when I, in, when I got out of college, my first job out of college was um, I was a, a retouch artist for a photograph retouch artist for a company that did images for advertising. So I was working in the most corrupt field imaginable. I was trying to convince more and more people to smoke a particular brand of cigarette. And I was using my skills and abilities to create an artificial image to create synthetic a synthetic universe of images that would lie people lie to people and tell them that you know if you smoke you get to hang around a campfire with these cool cowboy guys or if you smoke you can be a stylish woman who plays tennis you know that was what i did to pay my rent absolutely indefensible like just atrocious behavior for a person but I, that's what I did. I demeaned myself in that way to make a living so that I could work on music in the background. And I, I can't fault anybody who has to do any kind of mundane thing to pay the rent. I'm, I'm never going to pass judgment on somebody for what they have to do to make a living for that reason, because it enabled me to be part of this music community, which has meant so much to me and enabled me to be a resource for all of them. Any uh, final questions there, Rich? Uh, I, I just appreciate, I appreciate everything that, uh, that you're saying, Steve. It's, it, it's incredible to, uh, you know, your, your dedication to, uh, to maintain in the industry. It's one of the, one of the hardest things to do is to, 
create create a stance and to uh, pu- push push back against uh, what you're calling the the mundane to push back and make a make a difference long term is uh, is really an, an exceptional piece of work for someone's lifetime. The the main thing there. I'm on a, I'm on a, there's a, a message board associated with the studio. It's down at the moment because we're rebuilding our studio website, but there's a message board associated with the studio and a bunch of the people on that message board came up with a slogan, which kind of embodies the, the indie spirit, like the spirit of people who are doing things for their own value rather than to be part of an industry or whatever. And the slogan is don't quit. And that's literally the single most important piece of advice. If you're drawn to do something, just don't quit. If you keep doing it, then you'll, you know, you'll look over your shoulder one day and you realize, man, I've been playing music for 40 years. That's amazing. You know? Yeah. But if you quit at some point, then, you know, the story ends there. So my advice is just don't quit. Just, you know, it may not seem like there's any value in it at the moment. You might not be getting any, any respect for it at the moment, but I mean, we've all seen things happen where a band that was kind of unknown in their day, their music has survived and has enjoyed a renaissance once it's been discovered on the internet. Like that's happened to dozens and dozens of people. And there's no reason to think that your music, if you're making music right now, there's no reason to think that your music couldn't get that same kind of treatment in the future. If you don't find an audience right now, you might find an audience in the moment, but if you don't, there's no reason to think that your music won't be just as valuable in the future as these other sort of rediscovered gems, you know? One last thing, actually, I was thinking of uh, that I got to get your, your take on is uh, the whole streaming, uh, this whole streaming world that we're, we find ourselves in. Yeah. Uh, What's your take on that whole technology? Streaming is an extremely exploitative industry. That is, there is money thrown around, but very, very little of it trickles down to the artists, right? It was, a, pla- it was a, a technology that was derived and devised as a way of maintaining the sort of scarcity model that operated when the music business was about selling CDs and records, right? If you're selling CDs and, and records, like people have to go to a store and buy them or they don't get the music. And so there was a kind of a gatekeeper aspect to the professional music industry. Like, If you couldn't get your records on the shelves, then no one could buy them. So the record stores and the chain stores were very powerful. If the radio stations and the MTV weren't promoting the music, then nobody would know about it and they wouldn't go to the store to buy it. So they became very powerful. There are all these players, all these people that weren't involved in making music, but they were sort of administrative leeches that were all all like unnecessarily powerful, right? That's all gone now. That whole industry has collapsed. The selling of physical records is a niche industry now. It's a very, very small part of the music business. And it's actually much more honorable now than it ever was because now it's all specialty labels who are serving a community of people who are, you know, in general, quite supportive of the artists on the labels and the labels themselves are working collaboratively with their artists rather than trying to exploit the artists. So, the record labels that have survived, generally speaking, are the reputable and honorable ones. But the, the streaming aspect is a way of re-engineering scarcity. So you can only hear this music if you listen to it on this stream that's controlled by this company. Uh, and, uh, and that's a way of creating scarcity that doesn't really need to exist, you know. And I cannot believe that that is going to survive very long. That, that way of doing things, that way of sort of locking people out of content is the, behind a paywall. I, don't, I can't believe that that's going to survive very long, especially when there are other models for people to use to get their music out. Like you can put music out for free on things like YouTube and Bandcamp and SoundCloud and, uh, and there's, you know, there are just more and more avenues for people to expose their music for for free and more and more ways for people to to participate in the career of a band. I mean, there are all the the Kickstarter and GoFundMe and Patreon and all of these things that are, are ways for an audience to directly support the work of an artist. And the fact that those things have survived and become quite robust and are getting bigger 
implies that that is a model that can be further exploited and further extended. Um, whereas this are sort of artificial gatekeeping seems doomed to failure to me. I'm not particularly worried about streaming services. Yes, I think they're, they're grotesque and exploitative. And I, I think that they pay far too little to the people who make the music and far too much to the people who own copyrights and have negotiated deals for themselves. Uh, but I also don't think they're going to be around for that long. I had a friend at the dawn of the CD era. Uh, uh, I had a friend, John Loder, who ran a record label and a studio in London. And in the mid eighties, when the compact disc was like the, the, the crown jewel of the music business, like we can make this thing for 30 cents and we can sell it for $15. It's fucking amazing. Right. That was the thing that was going to save the music industry and drive the, the future. My friend, John Loder said, that thing is doomed. Vinyl records are going to last way longer than CDs and CDs are, we, we have a window of exploitation of maybe 10 or 15 years on CDs and that's it. And I, and I said, well, why? It seems like so clever that you have this little permanent thing that can store so much music. And he says, without missing a beat, he says, can you imagine something smaller than that? And I was like, well, yeah, actually I can. And he said, can you imagine having nothing? Like, yeah. And he's like, okay, first it'll be smaller and then it'll be nothing. And he's, he was absolutely right. He's dead now. And I wish he was here to see how right he was. Rich, any final question? I was going to ask you, questions. Steve, let me ask you one thing. The, uh, the one thing that I've seen in artists over the years is there was, uh, I find that there's been a change in the, uh, the need for artistic expression versus the need to succeed i.e. that artists will say, well, I want to be like Artist X. Artist X is selling this many records. And I have literally been in sessions where they're listening to the other record and they run up to the microphone so they can emulate the voice better. So there's this <laughs> strange but true, right? Yeah. And so what I'm saying is, is that sort of mentality of the need to succeed, the, you know, the, the social media to, to be out there and as opposed to expressing music for yourself, do you think that that is diluting the quality of, uh, of expression of what artists are doing? Uh, I mean, I think that's on a case by case basis. <clears throat> you can find people who are diluted in that way, uh, but I, that's always been true. Like that's nothing unique to these times. People wanting to emulate their heroes is one thing. People wanting to just do copycat something to sort of get on the gravy train like that's always existed that that there's nothing new about that i mean I, it just yeah I, I think there's always there's always a tier of artists who are trying to do something that's uniquely theirs and that's driven by the creative impulse and then there are always going to be sort of bottom feeders and who are just trying to do whatever's trendy and whatever's hip at the moment and I mean, I'm sure if you went back 500 years to before recorded music and there were these court musicians, uh, you know, everybody would be envious of the one lute player who had the extra string and then they would start adding an extra string on their lute. You know, like I'm sure people would, that, that impulse was there, has always been there. I'm certain of it. Sure, sure. Well, Steve, I got to thank you, man. Um, you've been very generous with your time today, and uh, thanks for uh, having me. I, I'm just so I'm just so pleased. Uh, I, your man, I greatly admire. So thanks again, and thanks for everybody at Imsta, Steve Albini. Thanks for having me. All right, thank you, guys.